and amen. Now, Friday night, we had our big Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot um, celebration here on Friday night. I want to show you a couple quick little pictures. That's what it looked like lit up. We had probably 70 or 75 people here. Had a beautiful feast. Folks from all over. We had people uh, that drove two hours one way to be here. Some people drove an hour and a half. Some people drove an hour one way. That means they had to drive back afterwards. And we prayed for the nations. We feasted and we prayed in just a beautiful time. Now, some people have a tendency to think that, well, you're Jewish, Bruce, pastor, rabbi, and so that's why you're kind of into the feast things. And let me tell you that I'm into the feast things because Jesus is Jewish and because these things are in the Bible. How many of you know we live in a time in our country when there's been, I want you to follow my reasoning for a minute, there's been onslaught of illegal immigration. There's legal immigration where people can follow the laws that have been placed and legally enter this country and apply for amnesty and everything else. And then there are those, and I've had friends who are illegal aliens. I love the people. But it's still breaking the law. Just like I tell you, how many of you like to drive fast? Now y'all stop lying. How many of y'all like to drive fast? Thank you. God bless two of you for your honesty. I know better. I've seen you on the roads. Three. Just because you love something doesn't mean it gives you the right to break the law, right? So let me ask you this. So I want you to think about this. So the nations flooded, just like Germany and Europe, when the Syrian refugees and refugees from those nations began to flood in to those countries. When they flooded into those countries, they brought their own traditions, they brought their own flag, their own culture, they brought everything that was foreign to a new country and to a new land. We stand as believers, we can easily oppose that. But yet we come and get born again and come into the kingdom of God. We bring foreign flags and foreign traditions that are foreign to the kingdom of God and foreign to God. And we're okay with that because it's comfortable and it's always been our tradition because that's just what we do. Even though it's not in the scripture, it's not biblical, and it's not the plan of God. So maybe the illegal immigration we really need to fight against is bringing our own gods and foreign flags and traditions into God's kingdom and really start getting a grasp of what the Word of God teaches is expected from the people of God in these last days. And when we do that and our life begins to align itself with the Word of God, all of a sudden our life Driving down the lane of life stops being misaligned. Have you ever driven down the road and you had a tire that was out of balance? We borrowed a van one time from New Hope before we owned our own van. And Miss Kayla and I, and I can't remember the other adult with us, but we took the children. Oh, it was just us. We took the youth and the children to camp. And... The van had new tires, but the problem with the van that we had borrowed was it had a bubble in the tire. And we're driving through New Mexico, and we're looking at each other, thinking, man, these roads in New Mexico are really bad. <laughs> and they were getting worse by the minute, until pretty soon the van... Now, I know, I'm a little slow. I should have figured out we had a bubble in the tire, but it took a while, until we're bouncing like this. And finally, we pulled off, didn't we? We pulled off the road, and the Holy Spirit sent a fireman right by there, and he followed us, and he knew how to change the tire because it had a weird thing that we'd never seen before, and we would have still been there. <laughs> and spared us. But when our life is not aligned with Holy Spirit's 
scripture and purpose and plan, then what we're really doing again is we're making God in our own image. And people, Christians, do that all the time. And anything that goes against our comfort zone and goes against our tradition, we don't want any part of it because when we came into the kingdom, we brought our culture, our tradition, and our flag. But the truth is, Holy Spirit wants us to lay down our life in His kingdom, pick up His flag, pick up His culture, pick up His purpose. Someone say amen. I want to talk to you this morning about us being called to pray. And I actually practiced this message because I brought it to, I was invited, it's been a crazy week, I was invited Tuesday and Thursday night to minister at uh, Lake Colorado City State Park. They had a Sukkot celebration there. And they had me come and minister. And this message, the Holy Spirit, already had me prepared it for you. And I also went ahead and prepared it for them. And I want to talk to you about how prayer changes you, aligning our life with the Word of God. You see, as we begin to pray, it's not like you're trying to convince God to do something. It's like Holy Spirit's trying to align your life with what God's already doing. And He's doing a lot. And I don't want to miss out on it. Someone say amen. So as you begin to pray, what happens is Holy Spirit changes you. I had somebody ask me one time, well, if God already knows what I have need of before I ask Him, then why do I need to pray? He can just answer. Because prayer changes you. It invites presence of precious Holy Spirit into your life so that you and I can be transformed to look and reflect more like Jesus. Someone say amen. I want to start in Matthew 21, verse 12 through 15. Then Jesus went into the temple of God. This was Herod's temple. Solomon's temple had been destroyed. Solomon, I mean Herod, then had rebuilt the foundations, rebuilt the beautiful temple, and that was the temple that was there in Jesus' day. It was later destroyed by the 6th Roman legion in the year 70 A.D., as they encompassed round about Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple of God, and he drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. So the first question that you have to ask yourself is, why would Jesus do that? Is he against people buying and selling? Is he against people selling doves? People had to buy doves to be able to sacrifice them in the temple. Was he against money changers? People came from all different nations, Jew and Gentile, during the feast to worship God. They had to exchange their money. So what was the issue? What's the picture? What was it that drove Jesus to the place where he exercised some righteous indignation against these individuals. And it's going to teach us something about our life. These individuals were taking up all the space that was designated as the court of the Gentiles. Everybody say court of the Gentiles. I'm going to show you a picture in a moment of the temple. And the outermost part of the temple was where non-Jewish people could come in any time of the year, but especially during the feast, and learn about God and see a reflection of who God is. And how many of you know God is a God of all people, Jew and Gentile? And he's always had a heart for people. And so he created in every temple an area that was for non-Jewish people to come and worship. It was that place that the Sadducees, that was one of the denominations of the Jews, sects, S-E-C-T-S, the other was the Pharisees, but the Sadducees were sad, you see, because they were the people who didn't believe in angels, they didn't believe in the resurrection, they didn't believe in the supernatural, or the de they didn't believe in anything. They were kind of like, well, I won't pick on a denomination. They were kind of like some of today's ministers, that they don't believe in anything. I was talking in this one particular denominational 
man in another city one time goes, oh, I don't believe in the virgin birth, and I don't believe in the resurrection. And I'm like, dude, you're, you shouldn't even be a minister. You've got more things you don't believe than you do believe. He would have been a fine Sadducee, you see. The Pharisees, they believed in the resurrection. They be I mean, they had their issues, but a lot of them ended up getting saved after, after the resurrection of Jesus and going on to follow the Lord. And some of them were even in the upper room, some of the 120 on the day of Pentecost when precious Holy Spirit came. So the Sadducees had it set up where the feast days were a money-making time, boy. Because what they did is they weren't going to block the Jewish path for the Jewish people, but the Gentiles, well, they're just, they're those people. And those people, they don't need that space. So let's just set up the money changers and the doves in the court that God set up. Hello? Who set up the temple? It wasn't man, it was God. Who set up the feast days? It wasn't man, it was God. It wasn't Jewish people. Hey, I've got an idea. Let's have seven feasts. It was God. Someone say amen. amen. But they decided to use what God had purposed for one thing for something completely different. And so Jesus, he didn't throw a tantrum. It was all premeditated. He thought it all out. How do we know that? Because the scripture says that he sat there and he made a whip. He made a whip. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever looked at the whips of those times, but they were long braided pieces of leather. Ladies, you ever braided somebody's hair? The longer the hair, the longer the time it took to braid. Can you imagine braiding a long whip? Are you following me? So he sat there and was thinking about this. The whole time he's braiding that whip, wanting and desiring to restore God's purpose and God's plan to the church. God has a purpose. What was his purpose? I'm going to show you this picture. Take me to the picture, guys. Uh, oh, Josh isn't up there. Tiffany's not up there. All right, well, let me go in order. That's okay. That's okay, bro. Yeshua, Jesus quotes Isaiah 56, 7. Premeditated this cleansing. He sat and took time to braid a whip together. Now I'm stuck. There we go. Thank you, brother. So this is the picture, guys, of the temple. And I want to show you something. This over here is where the Holy of Holies was, okay? Around it's the court of the priest, the altar, the sacrifices. This was the court of the women. Yes, ladies, you had your own court, but you didn't know that, did you? That was the court of the women, where the women could go. The women couldn't go past that court. And then the outer part of the temple, but it was still in the temple, is the court of the Gentiles. That's where the non-Jewish nations could flow to to hear the word of God. It was in the court of the Gentiles out here where they had decided, the Sadducees, to take up the non-Jewish people's room to pray and seek God to sell doves and exchange money and everything else. Do you get it? Because it's those people. You say, well, those bad Sadducees. Yeah, but what about us? What about when we look at these people whose culture and whose sin is an abomination to us, do we say, well, that's them, or do we have a heart of compassion that moves us to pray for them, moves us to pray for this nation, moves us to love people who might be unlovely and whose deeds might be unlovely. Can you move me back, Pastor Brown? Oh, I'll move it back. See. What can we learn from the fact that Jesus expressed great anger towards religious leaders who did not care about the hurting, sinful, broken people and unclean Gentiles? Well, they're just unclean Gentiles. Well, I'm not a Sadducee. No. Many believers are. They won't reach out to anybody other than other Christians. Their friends are their same friends they've had. Jesus wants us to have a heart for the lost. Amen? To pray for the nations, to pray for our nation. 
Things are not going to change in our nation through political uprising. They're only going to change through spiritual awakening. When you study the history of this nation, I've shared this before, but there have been two great awakenings in this nation. In 1758 and later in 1858. And they brought about radical change to a nation that the people, the Christians, who wrote at that time before the awakening, they thought there was no hope for the nation because it was so far gone. Now that was their perspective back then. They should say it now. We need the Holy Spirit in a serious way. Amen? And church outside of God's way doesn't work. I don't care the smoke machines, the colored lights, the black tile, none of that's making a difference. The only thing that changes people is the spirit of the living God in people's hearts. Now you can have all that stuff still have the Holy Spirit, I get that. But I think that we compensate for atmosphere, and the atmosphere I want is Holy Spirit. Man, people walk in, they should be able to sense, man, God is in this place. Because we're here. Amen? Amen. I've walked in lots of places where God's people were, and you can't sense the Lord. I'm just being honest with you. What might we be doing today that would kindle Jesus' anger in a similar way? Have we set up some distractions that are keeping other people from coming to faith? Have we lost a desire to even reach out to the lost? Why don't you watch this? Turn it up, please. Press the mute button for the digital. The one that says digital. I'll get a text. Y'all are patient, aren't you, Jeff? Excuse me. thing this scene is missing is the whip. That's actually a great representation of the court of the Gentiles right there. You know, if things that upset the Lord should upset us. Okay? And Holy Spirit wants us to care about the things that the Father cares about. And not to be like the Sadducees and set up our own flags, our own traditions, our own things, just because that's the way we've always done it. Does that make sense? And what happens is, as you begin to obey the Lord, Amazing things start to transpire in your life. 
as that obedience starts to work its way into your life. Look what Jesus said to them after he tipped over the tables and threw the money changers out and those that sold doves and all those that were selling things in the improper place in the temple. He called, he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of what? House of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves. Den of thieves. Today's temple is not you now of rock, but you know the Bible says that know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. If the temple that was made out of rock was called a house of prayer, how much more is this temple that precious Holy Spirit resides in supposed to be called a house of prayer? Everybody say house of prayer. Everybody say, my temple should be a house of prayer. Did you know that in the wilderness, as Israel escaped Egypt and the Holy Spirit instructed them to set up the tabernacle, just as he set the very first ever sacrifice that was to be offered to the Father, The Heavenly Father, out of heaven, sent fire that devoured that sacrifice supernaturally, listen to me, to dedicate the tabernacle. Solomon, as he finished and completed the work on the first temple, and he prayed, and you can read a beautiful prayer of dedication of the temple to the Lord, and he set the very first sacrifice out at that temple, Guess what came from heaven and devoured that sacrifice? Everybody say fire. In Acts chapter 2, listen to me, in Acts chapter 2, now the temple is in stone and it's not tent material. Now the temple is human beings. In Acts chapter 2, at the very first sacrifice, which was flesh, humans, at the altar of Christ, the 120 in the upper room, what came down out of heaven? Tongues of fire to dedicate the sacrifice. Those who have died to self and been raised to new life in Jesus. Do you see the picture? You are the temple. You are now that house of prayer. Is his temple of your life and my life called a house of prayer? Or have we made it into a den of convenience? Ain't no God, ain't no preacher, ain't no Bible going to tell me what I'm going to do with my life, my money, and my time. Then how is Jesus Lord? If Jesus isn't Lord over all of you, he's not Lord at all. He's just another idol telling you what the word says. Many will come on that day, it says in Matthew 24. Lord, Lord, we did wonderful things in your name. Miracles. We prophesied, preached in your name. They'll turn to them. Depart from me, you who work iniquity, because I never knew you. What's that mean? People doing God's work their way. People serving God with their flags, their thing, their way. Something I take to heart. You see, I think time is precious. God's outside of time and space. How many of you know that? He sees all the timelines. He sees it all. He's outside of it. But for you and I, because we have this thing called birth and this thing called death, we have a limited span of time in this life. And what we do with this limited span in this life has an incredible ripple effect for your eternity and for my eternity. That means time is precious. So I need to make sure that my time which is really his time since I'm his temple. So if I'm his temple, 
then my time is no longer my time, but my time is now his time. And my stuff is his stuff. Why? Because Holy Spirit doesn't reside in a holy of holies above the Ark of the Covenant anymore, but Holy Spirit resides in the Ark of your heart, in your life. The God of the universe is in the believer. Can you, can you realize that? I'm telling you what the Bible says. I like what they say in the Truth Project. Do we really believe what we say we believe? Have you filled up your courts with idols of destruction? I don't know. I hope not. If you have, we all have distractions in our life. But my prayer has been, Lord, let's sweep the room. Amen? Let's sweep the court. Let's, let's make room for God's stuff. Because we always have room for our stuff, right? We're being called today. That's all right. They were this quiet Thursday night, too. We're being called today to cleanse this temple and to turn this temple back once again to becoming a house of prayer. Prayer meeting in America is the worst attended meeting. But why? I'll tell you why. We really don't believe. Because if we believed and we understood that we could be flying with the eagles instead of walking with the pigeons, man, every chance we had to pray with other believers, we'd take advantage of it. Because God changes me when I pray. And he hears, and he moves, but he changes me. Then, everybody say then. Yeah. This is verse 14. We hadn't moved places. Then, after he cleansed the temple, after he kicked out the money changers, the dove sellers, all those people doing their stuff with their flags, their traditions, in the purpose and the place that God designated, be a place of prayer and seeking God from other nations. Then, everybody say then. Then, then what? Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. You see, we want the blind and the lame to come to the temple, but we haven't cleansed the temple. We haven't turned this temple of our life back into a house of prayer. So we have prayerlessness and we have powerlessness. And the blind and the lame come and they leave just as blind and just as lame as when they first showed up. And then we're going to have the gall to blame God. Tell you what, Holy Spirit's moving. He is doing miracles and nations, guys. And he is going to move in these final days like you and I could not imagine. And I'm going to be a part of it. Yeah. Not I want to be, I'm going to be. In this flesh, it might come kicking and dragging, but it's coming too. It's got no choice unless I die, amen? <laughs> Friday night, I thought I was going to die. I was so sick, and we had limited help. Thank God for Josh and Tiffany and Lupe who worked all day, and Samuel, who worked all day helping us set up, because I had work and sit down and work and sit up, because I was so, so sick. But the blind and lame came to him to be healed only after the temple was cleansed. You see, the power of the Holy Spirit resides in you. We need to stop looking for a preacher who has the anointing. You know, people travel all over the country looking for the anointed preacher. You have Holy Spirit. You have the anointing. Man, I'll tell you what, guys. The Lord will do more that you'll never hear about from the pulpit through people in the congregations whose lives are fully turned to him, and he'll do incredible miracles. The days of the Billy Grahams, I hate to say this, but it was prophesied when Billy Graham died that that anointing and that mantle wasn't going to pass to an individual. It was going to pass to the body of Christ. All believers walking in the anointing of winning souls and seeing the power of God exercised through their life. Only after the temple was cleansed 
and only after it was turned back to its purpose as a house of prayer did the presence of the Spirit of Messiah come and heal. Now, some reasons why people don't pray. Some people don't pray because they don't know how to pray. If you're a new believer and you don't know how to pray, just know this, every one of us was one time a new believer and did not know how to pray. Right? I bought, when I was a new Christian, I bought something called the Jesus Promise Book. It's a pocket promise book. It had scriptures and it was listed in the order of uh, topics. Like if I was angry, I would look up anger and open it up and there was all the scriptures. And I'd just read them out loud. And that's how I was praying. I didn't really know what I was doing. And then somebody helped me and they said, well, Bruce, you know, you talk to God like he's your best friend. I thought I had to talk to him in King James. Thou old Lord, and I love King James. It's a beautiful, beautiful version. But I didn't know. I didn't know. You follow me? So now, wow, so he's my best friend, so I can just have conversation with him. Amen? Now that's cool. But then I learned, now I can pray this scripture, and when I'm praying this scripture, I'm coming into agreement with the Word of God, and there's power in that. Then I learned, wow, if one of us as a believer can put a thousand to flight, and two can put ten thousand to flight, now if I grab me a brother, or if you're a sister, grab yourself a sister and pray with them, we don't have twice the power. We've got ten times the power to pray. Ten times the power. Wow. That's a lot of power, amen? If I offered you a dollar for lunch, or I offered you a hundred dollars, which would be better? A hundred. Thank you, Miss Ruth. She's on the church council. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praying by yourself is awesome, and we need to, amen? But you want to multiply that power by 10. Find somebody else to agree with. Now, all of a sudden, man, they just start to rock the world. Amen? The disciples, guys, I'll be honest with you, I don't know what you picture, but they were not Leonardo da Vinci drawings. These were young, messed up kids that were Jewish, but they were kind of goofy. I'm just telling you, read the Bible, right? They were a little bit goofy. And God was able to use them to transform the planet. So we're all goofy, but God can use us to transform the planet. He's just saying, you know what, guys? Get rid of your own flags, your own traditions, your own culture, and make a decision, I'm going to do things God's way. Because His way, man, wouldn't it be crazy to go live somewhere and say, I'm going to do it my own way. I mean, we're illegal immigrants in the kingdom of God. And we don't even realize it. I'm going to take four more minutes because the ladies took a little bit of my time, so I'm going to take a little bit of y'all's time. See how that works? And now I'll just preach part two because I probably got about another hour to go. I won't. Four more minutes. But when the chief priest and scribe saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children, everybody say the children, crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. When precious Holy Spirit starts doing awesome things, guys, the religious, self-righteous individuals start getting very indignant. And you know, children, they recognize the Spirit of God. I tell people that the babies love me. And it's not because I'm like, just not the hair on my face. Though it could be. But I think babies sense the Spirit of God. Amen? My son, even when he was small, I mean, he had like this discerning spirit. He's like, certain people he'd want near and certain people he want. Children, they can sense the Spirit of God. And these children, man, they sense the presence of God. This is in the same place where Jesus had just cleared out the money changers, the dove sellers, all those doing the stuff in the court of the Gentiles, cleared it out for the purpose of prayer and seeking God, now the children are crying out in the temple. 
And where are they crying out? Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna. In Hebrew it means rescue, O God, save, O God. And they're crying out to the Lord. Wonderful things are happening. People are getting saved and healed and set free and delivered by the power of the Holy Spirit. But those who have always, we've always had the money changers here in the court of the Gentiles. How dare he do this? Forget the changed hearts and changed lives. But you see, Jesus, you removed my flag from your kingdom, my tradition from your kingdom. I don't like that. But I'll tell you what, you may be more disappointed in heaven than you think if we don't change our hearts. Because heaven's going to be God's thing all the time and His way all the time. Exclamation of adoration. Religious people always want to maintain the status quo. Listen, guys, I get it. We're creatures of habit. You go to the restaurant, if you go to the same restaurant, chances are you go to the same restaurant all the time. Chances are you probably want to sit at the same table all the time. Then we come to church and we have our own chair. Hate to tell you this, you have no chair here. If somebody's in your chair, they're not in your chair. This means you didn't get here early enough. Right? But listen, it's just our human nature. It's just how we are. We like stuff to stay the same. God never changes. He's the same. But I hate to tell you this. We have no choice but to change. Because we're not yet a mirror reflection of him. We're a mirror reflection of our traditions. We're a mirror reflection of our flags. We're a mirror reflection of the things we grew up with. We're a mirror reflection of the preachers we sat under, the pastors we've listened to, the books we've read. We're a mirror reflection of all that stuff. And I'm not saying all that stuff's bad. But if my body is his temple, and I better be reflecting him more than anything else. Isn't that a novel thought? His temple reflects him? Every head's bowed, every eye closed.